Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Shoko Asahara. If you're looking for a villain in real life, a good place to start is usually the leader of a cult. That is not to say that all cult leaders are evil, I'm sure that's not true. I haven't met a lot myself, but I'm sure there's a stand-up few out there. But those ones are for sure struggling under the weight of some of the most horrific people who have ever lived, i.e. Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles, Keith Rainier, Charles Manson, you get the point. They suck. Anyway, unfortunately, Shoko Asahara is a name we can add to this list, and he was the leader of Aum Shinrikyo cult, and he claimed to be the reincarnation of the Hindu god Shiva. Spoiler alert, he wasn't. He said he was destined to lead his followers to salvation once the apocalypse came, but then, once he lured in followers, he claimed he could also teach them to levitate and develop telepathic abilities. Seems legit. Apparently, those who were the most skeptical, he allowed them to drink his bath water. I have no idea why or what this was supposed to be for, and I wish I could unlearn it to be honest, but now we all have to suffer with that information together. The cult continued to grow and drew in influential and wealthy people, and what did Asahara do? Well, he made a science division of his cult. It was where they studied the microorganisms living in his bathwater. I'm kidding, it was actually really messed up. This group went on to attack Tokyo in 1994, which took the lives of seven people. Then in 1995, they released gas into the Tokyo underground, which led to 12 deaths, 50 injured people, and more than 5,000 people with temporary vision problems. In the end, Asahara and 11 of his disciples ended up being arrested and charged, and they were all sentenced to death in 2004. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Iceman. While this name makes me think of someone whose superpower is shooting ice out of their fingertips, Richard Kuklinski got his nickname in the most gruesome way possible. He became one of America's most prolific killers after being hired by the famous Five Families in New York City. He had around a 30-year career as a contract killer, and while he only ended up being charged and convicted for four killings, he had claimed that the number was actually closer to 250. He killed his victims in a multitude of ways, and he was known for being especially cruel. His methods included feeding them to rats, sprinkling cyanide on their food, injecting them with cyanide, covering them with cyanide. Basically, if cyanide was involved, he was there. He was dubbed the Iceman due to the fact that he froze all of the bodies to ensure that the coroners would be unable to determine their true time of death, which is both clever and especially evil. In our number 8 spot today, we have Velvely Dickinson. Velvely is a name I've never heard before, and I thought it sounded kind of cool and nice until I heard about the person it belonged to. Velvely is one of the reasons why we should never judge a book by its cover. On the outside, she appeared to be like a regular, older lady who ran a doll store. Who would think the owner of a doll store would ever be a villain? Okay, probably everyone. Anyway, as far as I know, everything started out more normal, but once her husband passed away from a heart attack, things took a sinister twist as she started to take on some interesting side projects for a little extra cash. In 1942, the FBI was able to intercept a letter that was on its way to Buenos Aires. This letter spoke of a, quote, wonderful doll hospital and, quote, three old English dolls, and the FBI was like, hey, that's kind of weird, so their cryptographers went to work and it was uncovered that this letter was actually sent in code. As it turns out, these letters were actually sending military secrets to Japan and some of the information within them would have been extremely valuable if the letter hadn't been intercepted and never delivered. Turns out that Velva Lee had visited the Japanese Institute in New York City, befriended the Consul General and connected with a Japanese naval attache. The FBI arrested Dickinson and upon doing so they found huge amounts of cash along with the instructions for the code she was to use in the letters. She ended up being sentenced to only 10 years in prison. In our number 7 spot today, we have Vladimir Kozak. Okay, I cannot make this one up. Vladimir was a man from Moldova who was known for his 2005 crime stint that involved hypnosis. Apparently, he was able to rob banks by waltzing in, putting the staff into some sort of hypnotic state, and then telling them to hand over cash. I don't want to believe it, but what else am I to do? Apparently, this method ended up getting him tens of thousands of dollars from various banks. Okay, this story is really unbelievable and there's nothing that suggests that Vlad has ever been caught, so this story needs a little context to make a little more sense. At the time of these crimes, Moldova was the poorest country in Europe, with residents making an average of $2 a day. So it is thought that instead of hypnosis, Vlad might have promised the tellers to give them a share of his stealings in exchange for them to go along with this whole hypnosis story. At the end of the day, who knows for sure? 
I guess only Vlad and those tellers. In our number six spot today, we have Joshua Brady. Okay, so part of being a super villain can often involve having a group of people working under you who you delegate tasks to, but they are the ones who do the dirty work, and that is exactly what Joshua Brady did when he convinced a couple of people that he was an operative working for the CIA. He told them that he had a super important mission he needed assistance with, and it was an issue of national security. What was this mission, you may be wondering? Well, of course it was to rob some banks, because there is nothing like banks functioning completely normal and safely full of people's stored money that seems like a horrible threat. The mission was called Operation Downstrike, and in the end, it would be these two minions Joshua found who ended up foiling his not-so-foolproof plan. The two men were not able to get even a single dollar from the banks, and when the police caught up with them, Joshua tried to evade the police and even told them, quote, you can't make people disappear, only I can do that. What a super villainy quote for someone who had the worst plan ever. Unsurprisingly, Joshua was captured shortly after, but lucky for him, he received quite a minor sentence of only three years of home supervision. But as it turns out, Joshua was really struggling with his mental health, and this sentence allowed him to get the help that he needed. In our number five spot today, we have Alexander Solonik. Alexander's villain origin story is one that starts off on the side of justice as he got a job as a police officer in Moscow, but when it was discovered that he wasn't exactly well, a good person, he was dismissed from the job. After this, he spent some time as a grave digger, which is a strange transition, but again, we're talking about his villain origin story, so it doesn't have to make sense to us. He then was caught and sentenced to eight years in prison for a crime that he had committed, and it was during this time in prison that he started to make some contacts with the Russian mafia, because they were impressed that he was able to take down 12 inmates who had tried to harm him all at the same time. So if that kind of takedown wasn't super villainy enough, he then escaped from prison, which isn't really all that easy, and he went on to join a local crime organization and began his work as a hitman. He earned himself the nickname the Super Killer as he was often tasked with killing the leaders of any rival group. He was now infamous among the world of criminals and also the world of law enforcement in Russia. After his arrest, because he wasn't searched thoroughly enough, he pulled a concealed weapon out from under his raincoat in the police station and opened fire which took the life of five officers. I'm not even done yet. He went back to prison and then escaped again and disappeared but ended up resurfacing with a fake passport in Greece. In the end, in 1997, he was killed by a fellow hitman and ex-marine. This is truly one of the wildest stories I've ever heard. I couldn't even add jokes. It was just too jam-packed and we don't have that kind of time here. In our number four spot today, we have Gerard Blanchard. Canadians have a reputation for being polite and kind people, but Gerard Blanchard apparently did not get the memo. His story starts off while on a vacation in Austria when he saw the Kochert Diamond Pearl at the Schloss Schönbrunn Palace. In true supervillain fashion, he saw an opportunity to take something super valuable that didn't belong to him, so he created a plan. Then, under the cover of darkness, like he's in a Mission Impossible movie, he parachutes onto the roof of the palace, slips into the window he unlocked, and then switches the diamond with a fake replica one that he bought at the gift shop. I literally feel like I've seen this movie before, and it's called The Pink Panther. He even went back to the scene of the crime to watch people look at and admire this fake replica that they obviously thought was the real deal. He then continued on this path and went on to steal from banks and also stole more than two million dollars using fake credit cards. He was eventually arrested in 2007, he returned the diamond which he had hid in his grandmother's basement in Winnipeg, and while he would have been facing 164 years in prison if he was being sentenced in the United States, like I mentioned, he is Canadian so he was sentenced to 8 years and served 2. After his release in 2010, it is said that he was trying to kickstart his career as a security consultant. Maybe in this story the villain becomes the hero? In our number 3 spot today we have Victoriano. Alvarez. Victoriano certainly sounds like the name of a leader, and I guess this guy was kind of one in the worst, most roundabout way ever. Clipperton Island was an island that is located in the Pacific, and during the 18th and 19th century, everyone was trying to lay claim to it and rule it. I'm talking Britain, France, Mexico, and of course our friend Victoriano. He was actually the lighthouse keeper on the island, and in 1910, when Mexico needed to stop sending vital supplies to the island because they were focused on the rise 
rising revolution happening there, most of the inhabitants ended up contracting scurvy, which sadly led to their death. In the end, only Victoriano, a small group of soldiers, and about 12 women and children were left. The soldiers ended up passing away shortly after in an accident, so you know what Mr. Lighthouse did? He threw all but one of the rifles into the sea, loaded the one remaining weapon, and like the worst person he is, he declared himself king of the island. From here, he went on to kill anyone who disagreed with him, and who also was extremely harmful to the women who were unfortunately left on this island. That was until one badass woman named Tirza Randon simply had enough. She found a hammer and, well, the rest is history. In our number 2 spot today we have Dr. Chaos. With a nickname like that, it is no wonder this guy made it onto this list today. Also known as Joseph Konopka, this is a person that has been the source of much confusion and mystery because no one can quite seem to figure out why. Basically Joseph got up one morning, quit his well paying regular job and began recruiting followers on the internet, calling the group the Realm of Chaos. From here, he and his followers went and committed a series of attacks on different utility services, which ended up costing an estimated $3 million worth of damage. The group was responsible for 28 power failures and 20 other service interruptions at Wisconsin power plants. They committed arson, disrupted radio and television broadcasts, disabled an air traffic control system, sold bootlegged software, and damaged the computer systems of internet service providers. When authorities finally caught up with Dr. Chaos, he was found to be stockpiling cyanide in the tunnels of the Chicago subway system, which clearly meant that his plans to do evil were certainly not over yet. In crazier news, he was released from prison in 2019, so that's kind of terrifying. Also, what is it with the people on this list in cyanide? In our number one spot today, we have Marvin Heemeyer. Okay, so every supervillain needs like a machine or a tool that's like their thing, right? Like think Doc Ock with his arms or Green Goblin with his bad breath or whatever his thing is. Well, these villains don't have anything on Marvin Heemeyer, who built what was referred to as the Killdozer. Yeah, that sounds absolutely terrifying, right? It is. Basically, long story short, Marvin was the owner of an automobile muffler repair shop and lived in Granby, Colorado. After multiple disputes between Marvin and the city over zoning as well as health city accordances, Marvin had finally had enough. While the fight over fines were happening, for a course of 18 months, Marvin secretly modified a bulldozer by adding different layers of steel and concrete to make it bulletproof, and then he equipped it with cameras, and then he had three gun ports for three different kinds of rifles. In the end, he went on a two and a half hour rampage in this thing that caused approximately seven million dollars worth of damage. In the end, no one's life was taken except for Marvin himself, which was unfortunately done at his own hands. This truly is one of the most insane stories I've ever heard, and it has an absolutely tragic ending. I could not believe I have never even heard of it before. In our number 10 spot, we have Jonathan Edema. Jonathan always dreamed of being in the special forces, and when he grew up, he did just that. In 1984, he was discharged, and he went on to be become involved in security forces in Haiti and Thailand before he returned home for a while. After the falling of the Twin Towers on that terrible 2001 day, Jonathan's new goal changed to finding the man responsible. Which, however noble, and although we can perhaps understand why he wanted to dedicate his life to this, there are just ways to go about it, and his was not the correct one. John snuck into Afghanistan and set up shop where he won over the hearts of many journalists with his stories of working for the American government. He wasn't actually working for the government at this time, but he just told everyone he encountered that he did. He created his own little force, which he called Task Force Sabre 7, and basically together they kidnapped anyone they suspected was up to no good. These kidnapped people were then thrown into a sort of like prison that John had made himself, where they were treated terribly and harmed. Apparently some people who actually worked for the government were in on this and turned a blind eye, while some others apparently actually thought he worked for the government. In the end, he wrongfully arrested a member of the Afghan Supreme Court, which then sounded the alarm on his little operation. He was arrested and put in prison in Afghanistan, but just three years later he was pardoned and released by the then president. In our number 9 spot today we have Bernard Hunwick. Bernard Hunwick was nicknamed Barry the Bear and is one of the most infamous hitmen from the 80s and 90s, and despite that cute and cuddly nickname, he certainly is not that. 
He apparently has committed somewhere close to 300 killings while leading a group of six who were known for killing drug smugglers and the people they worked with in exchange for cash, of course. Despite his extensive list of crimes, he was only ever actually charged with one killing, which was that of smuggler and bail bondsman Richard Diego Messina. He ended up being found out due to a classic case of trusting the wrong person as one of his accomplices turned into an informant. This led to him being caught in the midst of planning to kill an undercover FBI agent who was posing as a dealer. That probably would have been pretty terrifying for that agent to later find out he was just barely missed in this horrible plan. In 1999, Bernard was sentenced to two life sentences and in 2013 he passed away in prison. In our number 8 spot today we have Papa Doc. Francois first won acclaim by fighting diseases which gave him the nickname Papa Doc. In 1957, Francois was elected to be the president of Haiti because people believed in him, but unfortunately things took a dark, dark turn. After foiling an attempted coup, he began to move his regime to a more autocratic or despotic one. He also attempted to solidify his ruling by incorporating elements of Haitian mythology into his propaganda. He named himself Baron Samdi and even created propaganda that depicted Jesus showing him as some kind of a chosen one. From here, he created his own police force and they traveled throughout Haiti and began killing any and everyone who opposed him. Apparently it was so bad that Haitians were afraid to express any kind of discontent even in private. In 1961, he was re-elected, which you might be sitting there wondering how. Well, of course, no one was about to run against him because of that whole killing everyone thing that was going on. It is estimated that he and his force killed about 30,000 innocent people, and he remained as president until his death in 1971. In our number seven spot today, we have Adam Worth. Adam's story starts when he joined the Union Army during the Civil War, and through some clerical error, was listed as deceased on paper work. Instead of correcting this mistake, he took advantage of it by then touring different regiments, signing up to collect the bounty, and then disappearing again. After the end of the war, he ended up heading back to New York, where he is then said to have led a gang of pickpockets, and that sentence feels like a musical just waiting to happen. In 1896, he then rented a shop that was above a bank, and while the shop was said to sell some healing ointments, it was really just a front for the actual plan. Adam's plan was to dig a tunnel into the bank vault located below, and surprisingly, it worked. After stealing the money, it is said that he fled to London where he then began living a lavish lifestyle full of yachts and racehorses, and he began planning the next heists in order to maintain this new life. He planned to hit banks located all over the world, and he even stole the portrait of the Duchess of Devonshire from the London Gallery just because he liked the Duchess. He was eventually caught, and he spent an appropriate five years in prison. After his release, he sold back the painting he stole to the gallery, which seems like the worst deal anyone has ever received. In our number 6 spot today, we have Glennon Engelman. Glennon Engelman was actually a dentist, but also a contract killer, which is quite a combination. Over the course of 25 years, Glennon lived this double life, with his first killing being in partnership with his ex-wife of all people. She had married another man and raised his life insurance. This is when Glennon killed him and the pair then split the earnings. This is the kind of format he used for the rest of his killing career, and while there's no normal way of being a career criminal, this is certainly quite a dark path. He committed at least seven of these crimes, but there is a chance there are more we just don't know about. It is also believed that there may be a few he committed for no monetary gain at all, and it was just purely for the thrill of killing. He was in jail serving two life sentences when he ended up passing away in 1999 at the age of 72. In our number 5 spot today, we have Rex Velvet. Not all supervillains are created equal, and that is clear with Rex Velvet, as he is definitely not like anyone else on this list. Rex has not committed any killings or bank robberies or really very many crimes at all, to be perfectly honest. His supervillainy comes from his huge sense of theatrics and the desire to take down a vigilante hero. In 2011, there were reports in Washington that there was a very serious vigilante hero known as Phoenix Jones who was fighting crime on the streets. While I'm sure this person had the best intentions, this 
vigilante justice was only creating more problems in reality and it was making the jobs of the police more difficult. That is when Rex Velvet was born. Rex donned a spiffy outfit and created videos that gave the hero an ultimatum in order to end his activities. Rex took his little persona even further and went on what some would call a terror spree, but truly in the most lighthearted way possible. The only real crime this man ever committed was stealing the Seattle Seahawks mascot Blitz, and that was part of a make a wish request, so I'm gonna go ahead and refer to that as not a crime. In the end, Phoenix Jones and the other vigilantes working beside him disbanded their group, which is truly for the best, and Rex responded to it in the most supervillain way possible. He of course invited them all to join his villainous squad. In our number 4 spot today we have Martin Shkreli. This piece of work is in jail for a few different fraud charges, but he is best known for one in particular. He's been nicknamed Pharma Bro, which is the worst supervillain nickname since Captain Cold. In 2015, one of the pharmaceutical companies that he was the CEO of obtained the manufacturing license for the anti-parasitic drug Daraprim, which is most commonly used to treat an AIDS-related condition called toxoplasmosis. Nothing wrong with that. Obtaining a license to manufacture this medication that people need to live their lives. Cool. Except he took this medication that has no generic version and hiked the price astronomically so that people could choose between their health or literally anything else. I'm talking about insane price hikes. The pill went from $13.50 to $750 overnight. Some people call him a supervillain, but I just prefer the term piece of sh**. In the end, because of this and other fraud charges, he was sentenced to 7 years in federal prison and $7.4 million in fines. In our number 3 spot today we have Giuseppe Pino Greco. Giuseppe Greco is incredibly notorious for the role he played with the Sicilian Mafia as one of their hired killers. He played an extremely significant role in the Second Mafia War that took place in the 1980s, where he carried out dozens of killings. He is known for using his favorite weapon, which is an AK-47, which truly gives insight into just how gruesome his crimes really were. He was a high-ranking member of the Mafia, but he enjoyed getting his hands dirty and ended up leading what were called death squads. He did end up being killed, as can be a common thing in that line of work, and his body was actually apparently dissolved in acid, which is all kinds of messed up. He ended up still being sentenced to life in prison in absentia after his passing for 58 different killings. It definitely takes a lot for them to still try you after you pass away, but I think 58 killings is probably a fair reason to do so. And remember, those are just the ones that are publicly known about. In our number 2 spot today we have Alexander Pachushkin. Also known as the chessboard killer, this is the man known to have killed at least 49 people, but it is possible that that number could be closer to around 60. His crimes took place between 1992 and 2006 in Russia, and he has said that his aim was to take the lives of 60 four people, the same number as the squares on a chessboard. That is absolutely horrifying. He later recanted that statement however and somehow made it only more horrifying when he explained that he would have just continued killing indefinitely if he hadn't been caught. After being caught, he claimed that his crimes made him feel like God. He said, quote, I feel like the father of all of these people since it was me who opened the door for them to another world. That is truly the most horrendous thing I think I've ever heard a person say. Luckily he was caught and sentenced to life imprisonment with the first 15 years of it being served in solitary confinement. In our number 1 spot today we have Miguel Angel Trevino Morales. Miguel's story starts when he spent his teenage years in a gang in Texas before he joined a group of Mexican special force deserters who had their own sort of group. Before long, he became their number one man and the group started smuggling drugs, investing into horse breeding, and they began conquering different areas of Mexico, all the while killing a lot of people. It is said that Miguel got so used to his life of killing that he couldn't sleep at night if he didn't take at least one life that day. He was known as Z40 and aside from the multitude of gruesome ways he would take lives, he was also known for carving a letter Z into their stomachs. If all of this wasn't enough for supervillain status, he is also said to have basically run like a training camp for people to become like him. He would force new recruits to take other people's lives in incredibly gruesome ways, and the whole thing is really just 
awful. In 2011, it is said that he pulled over buses that were full of immigrants who were headed to the United States, and he gave them all weapons and made them fight to the death. The winner of this, he then brought into his gang. In 2013, thankfully his spree was brought to an end when he left his hideout and was picked up by the Marines. Despite all of these crimes, he did give up without incident. Number 10, the eyeball man. Can anyone honestly say they aren't scared of this guy? The dude blacked out his eyeball, so he looked like a demonic Jack Skellington. More like Hack Skellington. Eyeball man's real name is Jason Barnum and is currently living out a 22 year sentence for shooting an Alaska police officer. Barnum's crime was heavily influenced by a hefty addiction to chasing the dragon. Three officers were investigating vehicle break ins and burglaries in South Anchorage and spotted a vehicle related to the attacks in a hotel parking lot. They checked out the security footage and saw a man carrying a tote to room 209. Barnum and two others were in the room and when officers entered the bathroom, the shootout began. Barnum was injured in the arm, but they arrested him when he got out of the hospital and they had to deal with how terrifying he looks, even though he's behind bars. So, yeah. Number 9, Eric R. Rudolph. Resourceful and resilient, Eric R. Rudolph quickly got on America's most wanted list. Why? Well, during 1996 to 1998, Eric detonated bombs four times in Atlanta and Birmingham, taking the lives of two people and injuring thousands. A five year manhunt ensued. He was finally caught in May 2003 after he was found rummaging through a dumpster. Later, it was revealed how intense his survival skills were. For five years, Eric foraged off the lands and survived off of buried barrels of grain and soy. He learned the schedules of when produce was going to be thrown out at grocery stores and stole what he could where it wouldn't be noticed. His motivation behind the bombings was a compilation of radical anti-gay, anti-abortion, and anti-government. The list goes on. He didn't get along with other people and when he confessed to his crimes, he showed no remorse. But when he was taken away to go to prison, authorities report that the man had tears in his eyes, knowing he was utterly defeated. What can I say man, your actions brought you to where you are now, so sorry about it. Sorry, not sorry. Number eight, Robert P. Hansen. The man the FBI was afraid of, and he was right under their noses. Joining them for lunch in the cafe, grabbing coffee with them, laughing at the cooler. But all the while, Robert P. Hansen was a mole. On February 18th, 2001, Robert was arrested and charged with committing espionage on behalf of intelligence services for the former Soviet Union and their successors. He was caught red handed placing a package containing highly classified information at a park in Vienna, Virginia, for his Russian handlers. When the FBI searched his apartment, it became apparent his payment was in cash and diamonds with the value of over $600,000. Hansen handed over dozens of delicate files, including FBI counterintelligence investigative techniques, sources, methods, operations. He exposed the FBI's secret investigation of Felix Bloch, a foreign service officer for espionage. He pled guilty to 15 accounts of espionage on July 6, 2001 and was sentenced to prison without the possibility of parole. He is considered the most dangerous spy in the FBI history. God knows what he said. Number seven, David Carpenter. I know Lisa Rena from Dancing with the Stars because I love a good foxtrot. Love it. But she's actually more well known for being a desperate housewife. But it turns out that her very own mother was actually David Carpenter's first victim. She knew him from work and he offered to give her a ride home and he had kids and a wife. Soon he was on top of her, hammer and knife in hand, but thankfully a cop was nearby who suspected something was amiss, so she was saved. David was sentenced to 14 years in prison where he was diagnosed as a sociopath with a very high IQ. He was released after only 9 years and quickly went on to commit more attacks against women. Good call on releasing him. Just saying? Like what? Ugh. I hate that. I hate that. At one time, he was even suspected of being the Zodiac Killer. Instead, he became known as the trailside killer who would prey on women on hiking trails. He took the lives of 10 people, though it's probable that there were more. Just two survived, and officers described that he was a kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of behavior. He was super nice, but then he had this insane, psycho, creepy, dark side as well. Number six, Zacharias Musawi. The ADX prison is intended as a holding cell to teach prisoners proper conduct before they are sent to penitentiaries. However, some are so bad that they are never released for fear they might inspire new crimes if allowed to communicate to those outside the walls. Zacharias is one of them. He is currently serving out six life sentences for assisting the hijackers who care carried out the, you guessed it, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. Musawi was placed on a watch list in 1999 when he 
started interacting with Islamist extremists. He could have prevented the attacks entirely, however, he lied to the FBI about the Al Qaeda and their plans to attack the US. He was even supposed to pilot a plane into the White House. He was arrested in August 2001 and went on trial in 2006. Throughout the trial, he praised the Al Qaeda and was removed for several outbursts. A very different tone to the note he wrote recently in 2020 renouncing Al Qaeda and appealed to younger Muslims to be wary of their deceptive ways. I really do hope he has genuinely released those ideals. However, he did do it in an attempt to relax his sentence. As recently as 2018, he was still referring to himself as a natural born terrorist. So, needless to say, I don't see things relaxing anytime soon. Number five, the marathon bomber, Jahar Sarnayev. Speaking of the ADX prison, there is yet another permanent resident behind its walls. Jahar Sarnayev is responsible for the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, which took the lives of three people and injured 250 people in the large crowd. This event shook the world, and I remember when it happened. I remember checking my phone repeatedly in order to figure out what's happening and follow with updates. And I'm sure a lot of you do too. He and his brother Tamerlane used two pressure cookers packed with explosives and shrapnel. His brother was shot during a police chase while Jahar was taken into custody. He was 19 when he committed the crime and 21 when he was finally tried. The trial consisted of heartbreaking testimonies from families of the injured and the dead. The death penalty was disbanded in Boston for decades, but it was considered for this case as it was a federal case. He was instead given his life sentence to be served out in solitary confinement with no opportunities to communicate with the outside world and that is probably how it's going to remain for the rest of his life. Wow, so young. Number 4 The Nathari Killers The Nathari crimes came to light on December 29, 2006 after 8 skeletal remains of young bodies were found in the drain of a house in Nathari, Noida. The owner of the house and the businessman Mohinder Singh Pander and the domestic help Surinder Kohli were arrested. Soon after they were found, even more bodies turned up. The village had been making noise about the disappearances for a while before anything was done, but now the Nathari killers remain some of the most horrific people behind bars. Over 16 young people fell victim to kidnapping, vicious bodily violations and death, which believed to have occurred between 2005 to 2006. Both men have been found guilty and the death penalty is in discussion, though has been delayed. Some believe that there is money involved in the case that may result in an unfair result, but considering the severity of the case, release is not really on the table. I'm not going to lie, it was hard to get a straight story on this, there is a lot of convoluted details across the articles I could find, so if you have more info you want to share, drop it down below. Number 3 Larry Hoover This dude is so powerful that he was continuing to run his operation while serving out a 200 year sentence for murder. Larry Hoover was slash is I suppose the chairman of the notorious gangster disciples gang. He was convicted 2 decades ago of continuing to run his empire behind bars. Hoover now 70 is serving out 6 life sentences at the supermax federal prison in Florence, Colorado. A facility that holds the worst of the worst. Terrorists, mobsters, anyone who would be a danger to anyone from the outside. It is said to be the most secure in the country. He established the gang in Chicago in the 1960s and has recently decided to try and take some of them down. The indictment accused seven state and national leaders of the gangster disciples of racketeering conspiracy, drug trafficking, witness intimidation and multiple murders including the 2018 death of a 65 year old ranking member of the gang on Chicago's south side. Beware if you've ever crossed Larry Hoover because even behind bars, you can't stop him. Number 2 James Marcello I honestly sound like I'm in a 1940s film noir when I was researching this. You'll see why in a second. He is the highest ranking Chicago mob boss in prison, also known as Jimmy the Man Marcello. Now at the age of 76, he filed a petition in June 2020 to have his sentence tossed out. Jimmy was one of 5 top criminals who were convicted of the 2007 Family Secrets racketeering case. He was convicted of taking the lives of Tony the Ants Belotro and his brother Michael. They were found in a cornfield in June 1986 after being beaten and strangled to death in Jimmy's basement. He was sentenced to life in prison in 2009 and currently resides at the Supermax facility in Colorado just like Mr. Hoover. Marcelo's father was also in the biz and so was his big brother, Big Mickey. The family had influence. There were crimes that hit the news and crimes no one knows about. Either way, now Jimmy wants out. He's like, ah, come on, give an old guy a break. Not for you, Jimmy. Not for you. 
And last but not least, Monstrous Modsley. Ooh, when I started reading about this guy, I literally had to step away from my desk. It, ugh, there were some images I just didn't want to read, but here we are. Meet the man so dangerous that he is now kept in a below ground glass box in complete isolation. Not only did he take lives outside of prison, but inside of it, he was the man everyone feared. The point that made me turn away was what he did with a spoon, which dubbed him the nickname of Hannibal the Cannibal. Robert Maudsley has been locked away in a glass box, just like the infamous villain, for over 40 years. He was sentenced to life in prison after taking the lives of four people. His crimes were so violent, the cops nicknamed him Blue because that was the color of the first victim. But his crimes did not end behind bars. He brutalized and took the lives of abusers of young victims behind bars in vicious and terrifying ways, just like you would predict people would do in prison. He was so volatile and like laissez faire about it that the only thing the prison thought to do about it was build him his own cage. He is allowed one hour of exercise a day. His childhood was riddled with abuse and he would often take most of it to protect his siblings. This violent childhood along with his extreme intelligence resulted in a violent appetite. However, after 40 years of psychiatry, appeals are being made to improve his well-being. Honestly, he did some awful stuff. If there is even a way out of the dark for even the worst and the worst of us, then it should be at least attempted. That's my mentality of it, but man, oof, creepy. Thank you.